Have a few questions in here that about five questions in here I read out a question and I attempt to answer these questions first question did Buddha discover that there were so many levels above the human existence on this earth yes uh, there are many sutras and sastras sutras particularly that mention about different, um, different levels of galaxies, about the universe, about planets so far away, about, about uh, living existence in other planets. There's many sutras mentioning uh, this information. So you, should, you, can, you can dig into it, there's so many of them. Both in the Theravada school and, and in the uh, Mahayana school about how the world was formed um, uh, about its ori of origination of this world and um, about beings it, it's written in detail it's just you haven't uh, explored into it now that you, you, you are interested in trying to know about it you can explore more into it Fortunately, we have information pack source, we call the internet, that you can venture into. Um, you can ask any questions from the internet. So, did the Buddha mention this? Yes, he mentioned it. Long before Galileo discovered uh, the existence of other planets with a telescope. So, you can do some research on it. Second question, did Buddha write all the sutras or did his disciples write them? If they did, were they accurately recorded? Well, uh, after the Buddha passed away, um, his disciples formed forums, uh, five in total, um, according to the Theravada, I think five. And of course the different schools, different sayings, some say four forums, some say five forums. Uh, they, all the, the Arahats and the disciples and the saints gather together and, um, and from their recollection, from their memory, they recorded the, the words of the Buddha. And they split it into three sections, uh, the Vinaya and the, um, the Sutra and the Sastra. Vinaya being the precepts, the Praktimaksa, uh, all the precepts that a monk should follow, the uh, Bhikshu should follow, Bhikshuli should follow, all the disciples, the seven disciples should follow. Uh, they are written in detail. Uh, how did they record it? Uh, you have to research into the um, cultural characteristics of India at that time. In the ancient times of India, they, they are not used to recording everything in writing. They have superb memory. They wanted to record it in here, in the brain, in the mind. So they recite everything. For sutras, uh, vinaya, they recite them, and they have ex excellent memory. Um, the whole sutra, they just memorize them. It may, it may, it may sound inconceivable to you, but even nowadays, you can find that kind of people. Uh, they have extremely long and good memory. I've heard that there was a, a, a girl uh, who, who, who can memorize the, the Lotus Flower, the Lotus Sutra, 28 volumes, and every word is right. 
And there are people with a lot with, with superb memory. <clears throat> so, particularly in ancient India, because everybody is, was so used to memorizing uh, that if they gather together, when the, the, the gathering is not just a few people, it's hundreds of people, hundreds of people in a cave or, or in, in a convocation, in a congregation, they gather together and systematically a certain procedures to carry out someone stand up and memorize certain sections and all the others would verify it. Yeah, in certain sections is, it is, you missed something or you didn't miss something. So they try to be as accurate as possible. According to history, that's how they recorded it. How accurate? We believe that they were accurately recorded. But however, nothing is absolute. We can say absolutely 100% sure that everything is accurate because anything that is man-made is subject to imperfection. For example, um, some, uh, some enemies of the Arahats or some, some opponents of the congregation may try to fabricate something later. They thought that, oh, this is what the, not what the Buddha said, and he stood up and, and said, no, this is not. And then maybe 200, 300 people say, no, according to our memory, 100, 200, that's what the Buddha said. Maybe this particular person was, no, that's not what I heard. But he couldn't influence 300 people. So afterwards, he may try to change it. I mean, anything can happen. Anything that is man-made, remember, has imperfections. Imperfection in, at that time, imperfections later. That's the reason why there is a lot of um, false fabrications of sutra. There are some sutras and sastras that, we, that are deemed to be falsely created. There are some like that. And some may not be the recordings of the Buddha's actual saying, but if they contain the Buddha's intention, the Buddhist philosophy about it, we just let them pass. We know that, well, according to some librarians or anthropologists, scientists, they think that, oh, this may not, this kind of language did not happen in 2,600 years ago. This kind of language written in such a way, it could have been just above 300, 400 years ago, and how come they use this kind of language now? And they question it, they, they query it scientifically, proving that, well, this, if that, that's, that's, that's the writing style that was prevalent, not in ancient India, that was prevalent in the Qing dynasty, in the Ming dynasty, or in some, then, then they know that it's fabricated, but as long as the content is right, uh, then we say, yeah, it's fabrication, but it's as good, it's as clear. And some people, some scholars may think that in, since 2,600 years ago um, extends the history of time up to now, within these 2,600 years, they could be, there could be some scholars who read a lot and who, who thought that, hey, maybe I should write a book to explain some more details in there. And um, he just wrote it out. And, uh, well, how do I get my book to be read by most people? Maybe I should fabricate my, another name to it. I, maybe I, I, I write down, it was books spoken by Azanga. 500, 500 or, or, or 600 years after the Buddha. But actually I wrote it. But I want this book to be read by, by people, the younger generation, by other generations. So I fabricated and said this, this was written by Asanga or Vasubandhu. It happened. So if you ask me, were they accurately recorded? Yes, they were. They were accurately recorded. And the questions can go to for any kind of writing. Was the Bible accurately recorded? Was the Holy Quran accurately reported? Was any book accurately recorded? That, that question could be posed not just to us. To anything, anything written. 
Okay, that answers the question. Next question. You said that we are here because of a diluted thought of our parents. Is it a bad or good thought? I think that is a good thought, so we can reincarnate and get enlightenment. Well, he thought that a diluted thought is a good thought because you can get, you can reincarnate and get enlightenment. Some people may laugh, oh, you know, the thought that gets you into reincarnation is a good one. I won't laugh at this question because reincarnation is under the means to get enlightenment. Imagine if we cannot reincarnate, if after this life it terminates, no more. After this life, after death, no more life again. So how can there be enlightenment? How can there be causality? How can there be cycle? So it's because of reincarnation, which is bad, of course, that we get enlightenment. So reincarnation is enlightenment. Enlightenment is reincarnation. Ocean is the waves, and wave is the ocean. So it's, it's through reincarnation that we know. It's through suffering that we be, will be better. Some people say Buddhism preaches disappointment because it talks about a lot of suffering, a lot of despair of the sentient beings. They misunderstand it. They misunderstand it. It is through suffering that we strive to be better. It is through our, our, our troubles, our problems, and our courage to confront those problems that we solve the problems. It is through despair and, and, and hopelessness that we strive for achieving to get out. Imagine when people were in the concentration camp in the Second World War, some people survived and some didn't. According to uh, some statistics that I read, all those is ironical, is paradoxical. How paradoxical? The physically strong guys, who was big and strong, usually did not survive. And those feeble mind, those, those feeble physique, but they have a strong mind, they survive the concentration camp. So it's not physical. It's the mental that is more, has more strength. Why? Because the mind is strong. The physical guy, the, the physical guy couldn't stand it. They don't have that mental strength. Well, look for that book I, I read. It, it is, I think the title of the book is called Man in Search of Meaning. That's become a classic in, in, uh, in the literature of, of, of um, liberation from suffering. And I think it was written by I forgot the name. I only remember the first name, Frankel, F-R-A-N-K-L, by 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 a, a Jew who who spent a few years in, in in the concentration camp, and he was a doctor, he was a, a psychologist, and um, he wrote that book. And all those who have inner strength, who are spiritually strong, they survive. They survive all the suffering in a concentration camp. And all those who gave up, who had no future, who thought, I have no future. In here is, is, is a provisional existence. My existence doesn't count because I, I can't see a future in me because I'm in a concentration camp and I, I would be finally be sent to the gas chamber for extinction. So I have no hope. But this man turned despair into strength. He only concentrating on helping his comrades, helping his people. And he concentrated all his gear, all his strength towards compassion. And he survived. He died at the age of 92. So, so which is stronger, body or mind? You can draw a conclusion. So what am I talking about now? Concentration camp? No. Diluted thought of your parents. 
We are born out of a diluted thought of our parents. Well, how do we get? How do we? How do we get here? It's because of that thought um, of a man and a woman, which breeds a relationship between a man and a woman that gives rise to you. If that isn't that thought, would you be here? It's funny, eh? You were born out of thought. I thought you were born out of your mother's womb. No, it's out of a thought. If, you, if there's no thought like that, would you be born? Physically, you're out of a body. But spiritually, mentally, you're out of a thought. What is that thought? It's abstract. It's inconceivable. It's untouchable. Why? Look at how a man and woman comes together for the adults. It's the attraction. It's the desire. And let's classify that thought. Some desire, it's bonds our relationship with husband and, and a wife, which is a legitimate, quote unquote, desire. And a thought could be born out of an illegitimate thought. A one night stand, or oh, you name it, <laughs> any kind of thought. I mean, you're better than me. I'm a monk. I shouldn't be talking about this. <laughs> I'm not going to classify thought. Otherwise, I'll be, uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll be saying sacrilege. I shouldn't be saying about this thought. But you know, you know that thought is diluted. That thought is impure. Because of that thought, you come out. Not because of the body you come out. And that thought arises from the mind. Can you trace it back and you say, mind? So, how do I become the Buddha? If I purify my thought, maybe I can see light. So I should watch out for my thought. That's exactly what the Diamond Sutra said. When a thought comes out, how do you overcome it? How do you breed purity thought? How do you overcome diluted thought? Remember Supati, the first question? What did is, what is Supati said? Ask. Dharagatta, uh, virtuous men and women, if they have a thought of samyas, a neutral samya sambuddhi arises in them, how do they sustain that thought? And if a diluted thought arises in them, how do they control and overcome that thought? Isn't that the first question of Diamond Sutra? Well, um, everything, I have, everything arises from causality and arises from good karma. Um, we know that Buddhism talks about the mind, and there are students who thought, who thought of Buddhism as, as, as a worshipping religion. They attended this session of meditation, but they didn't attend a talk like this. They never got a chance to know about Buddhism. They thought Buddhism was about crossing your leg and walking and running and all that, and they missed, they missed the boat. Imagine, they could have come for this lunch. What did they do? After meditations, they're gone for hamburger. But if they stay, they will cultivate that seed in their mind. That's karma, isn't it? That's the karmic inference that pulled them to bite on that hamburger instead of eating on tofu. I think this diluted thought is a good thought so we can reincarnate and get enlightenment. I agree. Not 100%. That thought... I don't think it's a good thought. It's a diluted thought. But if you use this diluted thought and use it as a means for liberation, that delusion becomes what? Become an enlightened idea. You can turn the table around. You can turn a delusion into an enlightenment. That's the reason why the sutra said delusion is enlightenment, enlightenment is delusion. 
Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is no other than emptiness and emptiness is no other than form. You can turn the delusion into, into enlightenment. Who's going to turn it? Not me. I can't turn it for you. You yourself has got to turn it. If I can turn it for you, there's no more deluded thought. If the Buddha can turn a table for you to change your deluded thought into purity, there wouldn't be any sentient beings because Buddha, out of compassion, would have done it for you already. He can't turn it for you. He can only tell, tell you, please, virtuous men and women, turn your table around. Make your delusion into enlightenment. Are you willing to turn it? You don't know. I'm, I want to sit in here, I want to use this part, I don't want to turn in the table. Okay, then you go through in reincarnation. And then, reincarnation is not enlightenment. And enlightenment is not reincarnation. So if you want an answer, yes or no? No and yes. The answer is in you, not in me. I'm not, I'm not giving any answer. Because the answer is you, is on, on you. Yes or no, you do it, not me. You answer it for me. Okay, that's all for this question. How does a person know that he is enlightened? What differences does that person feel? How do you know? How do you know that you are enlightened? Are you going not in are you going not step by step? Why don't you say, how do I get in in my process of getting an uh, enlightenment, how do I feel that I'm 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 progressing? You don't say, okay, how do I get complete enlightenment? I mean, how do I feel that I'm really progressing? But there's always a saying, if you always find that you can improve, if you know that you, have, you make mistakes, you repent, you know that this is something I should improve on. You don't obstinately maintain your idea and hold on to it and never change. In other words, try to be less egoistic. In meditation, there's joy too. There's a rupture of joy. That's, that's the uncanny part, inconceivable part of, of, of meditation. Sometimes in meditation afterwards, you feel very joyful. You feel a bliss inside. You feel you're overwhelmed with that joy. That could be the same feeling when you put up with something that is intolerable. It's just like when this person was in concentration camp, he was able to put up, put up with it, did a lot of good deeds about it, and later when he came back after, after the... Um, up to the surrender of the Nasi, he came back and, and, and write that book. He was overwhelmed with joy on what, on what he, has, he had done in a concentration camp. So you know already. What difference does that person feels? You feel the difference. And a lot of people told me the same thing. And they came to the temple, they joined meditation class, and, and, and some people expressed, or to some members, or to me, I think this changed my lifestyle. I was very unhappy before. I was egoistic before. Now, since I attended the temple session of meditation, I changed. I become a more tolerable person. I become a different person. Well, there was a card I received two days ago, and that card is in, in English. And uh, the lady was born in Canada, and she she doesn't understand Cantonese. The writing, he, he can speak. She can speak Cantonese, and uh, she, she can't write. Uh, she can only speak Cantonese, so she's now in Hong Kong working. And one day he came across my, uh, my DVD talking in Cantonese about Buddhism. And, he, and she listened to it, and then it starts to change his lifestyle. He said, I was depressed and I, I, I didn't like life, and now I'm a completely different person. And he wrote, she wrote back to, to say thank you. Uh, and she changed her daughter too. Just like a lot of members, who've been here for a number, uh, one or two years, say, oh, I, I changed my way of thinking. I, I feel more, more happy than before. I know my purpose of life. I, I, I know why I come to this world and where would I go after this. I know where about I come from and where about I'm going to go. I'm more certain in my destiny. I know that my destiny is not being fixed by a creator. My destiny is in my hands. I can create it. I can change it. So, that answers the questions. You have spoken before of a book about the monk 
who traveled to India and brought the teachings of Buddha back to China. Please advise the book title and author. Yeah, that book is, there was in the, um, in the Tang Dynasty, so some about 1,200 years ago, um, something like that, uh, in the Tang Dynasty, there was a monk who traveled all the way from China to India, and the trip took him three years, and his name is Xian Zhuang, so you click into the internet and, and find that. That's the monk's name. And the, the book, I think it's called Tai uh, Tong Sai Wei Ge. How to pronounce it? Tai, how to translate it? Tai Tong Sai Wei Ge. It's um, a, a, a East, an Eastern expedition in the Tang Dynasty or something like that. About his expedition from. Journey to the East is not. Journey to the East is Fa Xian Da Si. Journey to the East. Something like that. I, I, we can always give you the true name. I have a translation uh, uh, somewhere in the library. You can check the library. And there's such a book written in the Tang Dynasty. And um, he recorded, he studied for 17 years in India. And uh, he went there as, as, as a no. Uh, he was able to. In India, after the 17 years, he was able to, to become from anonymity to celebrity. In other words, from an unknown person to be the, the, the teacher of the Indian king. And he was retained by the king. He was not allowed to leave, to leave India. And somehow it, it, the, the diplomacy worked out that, that uh, between China and India that uh, he was permitted to go back. And not just permitted, being permitted, uh, uh, allowed to go back, um, he was also given a lot of sutras and gifts to be brought back to China. So when he, when he went to China, he was all by himself. When he returned to, 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 to China, when he, when he went from China to India, he was all by himself. When he returned from India to, to, to China, he brought back a whole procession of sutras and gifts and uh, statues and a lot of things, a lot of artifacts. Um, it's, it's a book worth, worth reading. Okay, so you should check that with the library. So, is that the last question? Yes, that's the last question. Okay, thank you.